equality, addressing harmful um, gender and social norms, and ending gender-based violence. It is also vital to ending the crisis in HIV prevention, which sees a staggering 460 adolescent girls and young women acquire HIV infection every day. Yet CSE is currently under threat in our region. COVID-19 and national lockdowns are restricting young people to access both uh, in school, so HIV and sexual reproductive health services, cutting them off from life-saving information. And we know this is to be true from all the partners that we've been working with. We have really struggled to get these services to young people. At the same time, we are witnessing a growth in oppositional movements who are highly effective in spreading misinformation about CSE. Mm -hmm. This resistance does not stop at the national level. At this week's UNAIDS PCB special session, governments will vote on the new UNAIDS strategy. Although the evidence tells us clearly that CSE is critical to ending AIDS among adolescent girls and young women, we know that member states are going, in, are going into the vote divided over CSE. In some, in some cases, it, it's over little terminologies. The topic of CSE has become a political issue, which is very sad because as we are busy politicizing, young people are getting infected, some are getting pregnant and ending up in child marriages and complications. It's clear that without strong leadership on this issue, our collective efforts to champion this agenda are likely to fail. Today, we are fortunate to have an impressive group of speakers, all of whom have expensive, extensive knowledge and diverse experiences in this area. And I think we are in for an insightful discussion on the strategies that have worked and our path forward. We want this to be a short, impactful session. I know many of us are now well-versed in, in attending virtual meetings, and I want to just reiterate a couple of house rules here today to help this session to run smoothly. This is a webinar for the duration of the call, attendees will be muted, but we strongly encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A function, and these will be directed to the panelists as time allows. We also know that this topic is likely to generate heated debate and we expect the opposition to be engaging in these virtual spaces. And that being said, we urge you, you to listen to what is being said rather than simply reacting to it. And of course, to keep your comments respectful because debate and not always seeing things the same way is also very healthy for the work that we do. In the interest of time, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our first speaker, Lita Betha, who is going to help us to frame today's discussion and draw out some of the challenges young people are facing in the region. Lita Betha is a 19-year-old advocate from the rural Eastern Cape, whose work focuses on well-being of teenagers, including their access to education and sexual reproductive health rights. She has, in her own words, been advocating for CSE since before she even knew what CSE stood for. She has been engaged in debate on CSE for several years and has participated in the South African government and UNESCO consultations on the topic. After later, we will introduce, I will introduce the next speaker and the facilitator for our session. At this point, let me kindly ask Lita Bertha to give us some opening remarks. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, I've, I have to keep my video turned off because I have very, very terrible network here in, in Johannesburg. And if my video is on, my audio will start to glitch. Um, as thank you, Mamu Lewis. As Mamu Lewis said, I'm a 19 year old from the rural Eastern Cape. And one thing I can tell everybody is that our parents, they leave us in the villages and to work in the big bad cities, thinking that the village is the most safe environment for us to grow up in. 
But what they don't realize is that in the villages, there's lack of access to services, lack of access to information, and there's just a lot of ignorance um, that is hiding behind conservativeness. Rural schools in the Eastern Cape, where I come from, the life orientation, life orientation period, which um, has components of CSE, has become a period where some educators do their administrative work. So they do their administrative work, they capture marks during CSE period where they were supposed to be taught about life orientation and comprehensive sexuality education, right? And it's, 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 it's very bad because I graduated matric in 2018. I was 17 years old. And now I just turned 20 last week and I'm doing my final year. And when I went through the scripted lesson plans for CSE, I found myself wishing and wanting to go back and actually get CSE from grade four up until grade 12. Because I feel like now at this point where I'm at in my life, I'm doing my final year and everything, had I received those CSE lessons properly from grade four until grade 12, I would be a very much uh, aware, you know, very confident and very much self-secure 20 year old at, 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 at this point. Another challenge that we face here in, in South Africa is that the very same teachers that are supposed to deliver CSE to us are the very, after 2 p.m. when school is out, they become the very, very same parents that do not want to hear of CSE. When I engaged with religious leaders last year, 2020, at the UNESCO engagement with Department of Ed Basic Education, together with other supporters of CSE, I was, I was so disappointed to learn that people fighting against CSE genuinely believe that CSE teaches children to have sex. And this just showed me that nobody actually knows what is entailed in, 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 in CSE scripted lesson plans, right? And when I was there, I learned that everybody that was saying something about CSE, it was mere misinformation and misinterpretation spread through the media by, by, by the opposition, right? So I felt like it was very important that as people who support CSE and who advocate for CSE, we need to put the content out there from grade four to grade 12. Let people know that the content is actually age appropriate. Nobody is telling grade four, grade four learners anything inappropriate or something they should not be knowing about at that particular age. So I think it is now up to us, people who believe and support CSE to inform and dispel these myths and help parents understand what CSE is and its purpose. And we must do it with the same urgency as the opposition, because I feel like sometimes we are too relaxed because everywhere I go, literally around Johannesburg, there's posters that say, teach our children maths, not sex. So I feel like as people who support CSE, we are not doing um, we are not doing it with the same urgency as the opposition. And it is for this reason that I'm very, very much excited about this session. And I'm looking forward to hearing the strategies that other stakeholders are using to defend and champion CSE. Because I'm telling you, I was a teenager two weeks ago, and I will tell you now that I really, really, really wish I would have gotten CSE. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lita, for those very, very appropriate opening remarks. And what is so nice is that you are a young person, as you say, you have just left that uh, adolescent phase just a week ago, and you do realize how much you missed and wish you had received certain information um, at, a, at a young age. One of the things, most important things you raise in your, in your remarks is the fact that when people take it for granted that young people who live in rural areas, because they do not have exposure to the many, many things that are in the urban areas, they are considered safe. But clearly you are letting us know that that is not the case. In fact, those young people are actually disadvantaged. They have no information, they have no services, and they have no education except to rely on the teacher who is also both a teacher and a parent and can just choose to wear either hat at any given moment. At this point, um, I would like to uh, 
introduce my next uh, guest and facilitator, Dr. Haley McEwan, who is a leading researcher on the global anti-gender or pro-family movement. And she has published widely on this topic in academic journals and popular media. Haley is currently a researcher at the Wits Center for Di Diversity Studies, University of Wits Waterstrand, Johannesburg, and a senior fellow at the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right. With, uh, without further ado, um, Henley, please um, welcome to this platform and uh, please in take the next sessions. Thank you so much, Lois, for your generous introduction. And um, yeah, and to, to Lita as well, I mean, for your really profound opening remarks. Uh, I think that, you know, so far already, we have already kind of surfaced a lot of the issues that I think we're going to be unpacking in our panel. Um, in the research that I've been doing uh, around this anti-gender movement and its attacks on SRHR, CSE, um, and, and any you know, like sex, sexuality, and gender rate related rights, um, you know, a lot of these issues that you have you've raised have, um, have surfaced. And um, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this discussion today. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, and then we're going to go into the, um, into the panel questions. I've got some questions for our panelists. And uh, I would like to encourage all of the participants joining us today. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, please, if you have any questions or comments, um, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then as time allows, we will um, ask those questions. So our first panelist, uh, we have a very esteemed panel today, and I'm very excited to be introducing you to all of them. Um, our first panelist is Amos Mwale, who is the executive director of Zambia's Center for Reproductive Health and Education. Amos previously served as executive director of Youth Vision Zambia. He is a member of the Global Advisory Council for UNFPA and was one of the key members that developed the Family, Pl Family Planning 2020 Plan for Zambia. Our second panelist is Joris van Bommel, who is Head of Cooperation and Deputy Head of Mission at the Embassy of the Netherlands in Uganda. His career is characterized by a combination of operational experiences in different developing countries and at strategic positions within donor and multilateral organizations. Third up is Clivert Wandingi, who is currently the president of Afriyam Namibia. He holds a bachelor's degree in common law, a diploma in sales and marketing management, and is pursuing a bachelor's degree in communications. He has been working in the SRHR advocacy space since 2005. Uh, fourth, our fourth panelist is Dr. Patricia Machawira, who is a leading education spe specialist who holds a doctorate in education policy from the University of Pretoria here in South Africa. Uh, she currently works as UNESCO's regional AIDS advisor for Eastern and Southern Africa, where she has been the lead person on the ESA ministerial commitment process, something I think we're going to hear more about today in the panel, um, which secured political commitment to scaling up sexual and reproductive health education and services for young people in the region. And finally, we have Rosette Nanyanzi, who is the acting gender advisor for the Ministry of Education and Sports in Uganda. Rosette has spearheaded a number of initiatives that promote gender equality in education. Um, some of these include the development and implementation of the National Strategic Plan on Girls' Education and the Gender and Education Strategic Plan. She supported the development and current implementation of the sexuality education framework and also conducts media campaigns to popularize the framework for the general public. Um, so thank you so much to all of our panelists for being with us today and again to all of our participants who have come to join this discussion. So um, my first question, um, it's actually a two part question. I'd like to ask uh, Rosette and Clivert. Um, so, so the question is very similar for the both of you, but I just want you to talk, you know, of course, from your own contexts. Um, but for Rosette, I'm curious if you can tell us a bit about what governments 
in the Eastern and Southern Africa region are doing to remove barriers, um, increase access and improve the delivery of CSE. Um, so in your opinion, you know, what could, you know, what is working, what could be perhaps done more effectively, um, what strategies have you seen that have been working well? Um, and then the second part is for Clivert. So I'm curious, um, you know, from a civil society perspective, um, and especially amongst youth-led organizations like AFRIEM, um, what are you doing to remove barriers as well, increase access and improve delivery of, of CSE? Um, so first I will hand it over to Rosette and then we'll come to Clivert. Over to you, Rosette. Um, is Rosette yeah, still so, um, so I think Rosette was having some trouble with her connection. Maybe if we move to Cliver and can come back to Rosette. I'm now back. Hi, Rosette. Uh, thank you very much. Hi. Hi. Hello, Maquel. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity. First of all, I want to thank you for organizing this. I want to give a brief background of what Uganda is like as far as sexual and reproductive issues are concerned. Uganda's population is about 40 million people with almost 77% young people below the age of 25 years. However, Uganda has a vision 2040, which views the youthful population as an asset for driving development. However, we need to note that young people in Uganda Rosette, we're having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. Um, we're only getting snippets. Um, are you still with us? I think we've lost Rosette again, so maybe we can move to Clivert's comments. I'm very sorry about that. Um, hopefully she will be able to rejoin. Um, Clivert, can we turn it over to you? Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope I'm audible enough. And my internet is not tripping like yeah. Rosette. Um, so I'm very sorry for her. I have a number uh, of challenges. Our biggest yeah. challenge. Let me give her a chance. Maybe someone can send her a message or anything, whether she to ask her if she's able to continue uh, or she can, Roland, can you, wait. Uh, so she doesn't interrupt me. Yeah, we'll send her a message now. She's currently um, dropped out of, oh, she's back. Um, yeah, I'll just send her a private message now, but Clive, if you want to continue. Thanks, Olin. Clivert, Sorry, colleagues, my networks. Sorry, Clivert. Sorry, Sorry colleagues. My network is really bad, but I'll continue from where I stopped. That as a country, we have a challenge with uh, the diminishing role of parents. Uh, initially, when, we were, when I was growing up, we used to have a lot of guidance from our parents as far as the topic of sexuality is concerned. That no longer happens. And this is a challenge to this country. And then the other issue we have as a country is that uh, that limits actually access to sexuality education is we have the fragmented fragmentation of interventions on sexuality education and use of unauthorized materials and messages which are not in line with our legal and policy framework. And then the other issue is that most of the interventions we are not taking into consideration, the S issues, most of the S issues that we are not being addressed, for example, GBV, menstrual health and hygiene, life skills education, and all these issues actually served as barriers for us to access sexuality education. So after the SC, the ESA commitment in 2013, as a country, we got back and we had it to do a number of interventions to ensure that we address these challenges. We set up an interministerial committee, which was chaired by the Minister of Education and Sports, but with the representation of a number of partners and uh, ministries, Minister of Health, Minister of Gender, Labor, and Social Development, UNFPA, UNESCO, 
UNICEF and UN, UN Women and a number of international organizations with the purpose of making sure that we operationalize data commitments in our country. So, our, so, so many of the activities that we set up as that in the interministerial committee included the development of the sexuality education framework, building the capacity of the different stakeholders, most so the teachers and tutors on sexuality education, and ensuring that sexuality education is integrated into the curriculum. Uh, the, the interministerial committee also had a task of development of materials and guidelines for the prevention and management of teenage pregnancy uh, and also other documents. What has worked? We have seen Sorry. increased collaboration. Yes, we have seen increased collaboration and partnership on these issues. And the key among these is uh, as a country, we've been able to conduct immunization on human papilloma virus using our multi-sectoral approach. So briefly, that is what the steps we have taken as a country to make sure that uh, we work together to, to implement sexuality education. Briefly, that Great, is what you. I have to say. I'm really sure, sorry for the network. Yeah. I don't know whether you are able to get my information because I, I kept on getting challenges. Thank you. Yes, Rosette, we heard you very clearly in the end. I think that it all sorted out, you know, we, we heard everything. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I, yeah, it's really interesting to hear. And it sounds like these various stakeholder engagements that you've been having um, have been quite meaningful by the sound of it. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, so the second part of the question was for Clivert um, to speak about what has been happening in, in terms of civil society organizations um, and increasing access to, to CSC and SRHR. Can you um, share with us, Clivert? Uh, thank you very much again. Um, maybe first of all, let me, let me just add to uh, my portfolio when you're introducing me. I think this will um, maybe try to justify also what I'm going to say. Um, somebody from the civil society organization. Um, <clears throat> I am also last year, I think towards the, the, the end of the year, I was um, very fortunate to be uh, appointed by um, one of our, he's now late, unfortunately. Um, now we lost him last year, but he was the chairperson of the standing committee of the national parliament and he appointed me to as from a youth-led organization a very esteemed youth-led organization which is afria to be the chairperson of the research committee of the national parliament this means i i am coordinating a, a number of young people and um other people from youth serving organizations to do research and to do the correct research and provide the right, the correct data and the correct information to the members of parliament when they are tabling motions and basically um, focusing in the area of sexual reproductive health, right? CSE, um, gender-based violence and so on. So I'm very fortunate and I'm, I'm chairing that, <coughs> that research committee at the moment. And like I said, that brings to that, why I said that brings to me to why I'm saying, um, actually, I'm one of the people that has been in the forefront. A little background is that, um, I don't know if you all know that Namibia is, was one of the Southern Eastern African countries that was ready to make a U-turn and to remove its member, to remove itself as a member of the ESA commitment where these promises and the commitments were made by governments 11 years ago to date correctly um, to bring the curriculum or the program of comprehensive sexuality education, which we believe already existed, but it was just comprehensively packaged into one curriculum that would then properly inform adolescents and young people in the schools. So Namibia was one of the, the countries, or is still the one, one of the countries 
that has made that commitment. And um, I'll be very honest with you, ever since the implementation of CSE in our country, we have seen numbers of new infection dropping when it comes to HIV and AIDS. We have seen numbers of teenage pregnancy, early and unintended pregnancy dropping in our country. We have seen more and more girls finishing school um, and going to tertiary education because they are well informed. We have seen a lot of communities developing and be engaging in um, uh, social uh, and health uh, work. So we have seen champions coming out of the regions that are, or the communities that are including local authorities and, and traditional authorities in support of comprehensive sexuality education, which is CSC. But last year we were about to lose that because um, one of, 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 of our uh, members of parliament decided that um, or believed uh, obviously with the support and the influence uh, to some of the groups that I do not want to bring up on this platform that are working very strong and very hard to, I, I would say confuse politicians um, that comprehensive uh, sexuality education is not good for the community, it's not good, it's sexualizing the learners at school, it's teaching uh, learners to become homosexual or it's teaching learners to become more sexually active. Um, so we, we receive that. But what have we done from civil society organization to answer the question and unpack the question? In Namibia, we are very fortunate, like Ms. Rosette said, um, we also have a body that is formed up of, we call it as a ministerial committee. It is called the National School Health Task Force. So the National School Health Task Force consists of government entities, which is the ministries, the different ministries, Ministry of Education being the chair of it, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Gender, Equality and Child Welfare, Ministry of Youth uh, being part of it, and also um, uh, local government, Ministry of Local Government. And then it has UN agencies like UNI UNFPA, UNESCO, UNICEF that are part of it. And then it then has a youth-led organization. AFRIAN is a vice chair to that uh, national, uh, national school and task force um, uh, as, as a youth-led organization and other civil society organization that are either youth-led or youth-serving organization. So what happened is that when we receive this, I, I still call it a very a disturbing and a very painful letter from, from, from the member of parliament uh, that was asking us, first of all, it was telling us that uh, the, 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 the program is not good for young people. Secondly, it was saying that if we want this program, we must provide evidence as to what the program has done. Thirdly, it was saying that if Namibia would drop this program and drop the membership, Namibia would not lose anything. That was very disturbing because you, you ask yourself like, wow, for the last past three years, what have we been doing? The results that they've been seeing, what do you think we have seen that result? Again, um, it boils down to, to, to say that, look at what happened in, 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 but obviously that was not yet reported. But one of the things that um, happened actually last year, I'm gonna talk about, I'm going to be talking about it. Uh, I don't wanna move away to also to mention that CSC and, uh, and sexual reproductive health right is actually the core mandate of Africa. So we literally, as Africa as a, as a youth-led network from the regional level to the national level, we breathe comprehensive sexuality education and, and sleep uh, uh, sexual reproductive health right. So that's what we move by. Um, so what we did last year, we then brought this, we, 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 we brought all the partners and we're very fortunate that government were on our side, the Ministry of Education themselves were on our side. So we brought all the partners, the stakeholders when it comes to the implementation of the program or the curriculum in the school. And we brought them together for one specific reason. That is to provide evidence, which means we engage with communities that we have worked with, where we have seen the number of teenage pregnancy dropping we engage young people to be able, we ask them to provide testimonies where young people are speaking to themselves because we, 
We in Africa and we the saying that nothing for us without us. You do not make a decision that's targeting young people without the voice of young people. If you want to withdraw the curriculum on comprehensive sexual education, first hear from us whether we need it or we don't need it. And that was the main idea. Let the young people be at the center of the response of CSE existing or is the abolishment of CSE. And we got different testimonies from different regions, uh, from different communities actually, uh, from the teachers, first of all, that are, are, are implementing the curriculum in the schools to the learners who are receiving the implementation of, of the curriculum to the community leaders. We are talking about faith-based. Yes, we had faith-based leaders that are against and that are still NDCSE. We have traditional leaders that are still NDCSE, but we have those that understand today what CSE has done. And we, we got testimonies from them. We got the media. I myself, I think I have released more than um, three articles that actually led me to be, to be summoned by the MP that wanted to withdraw and have a meeting with me because she felt like I was, I was attacking her. And I, I, my, 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 my article, and I'm willing to share it, uh, Claire, with you or anybody, what I said in that, just briefly explaining and unpacking what comprehensive sexuality is doing, what the curriculum says. We put a presentation together. We went to present to the member of parliament together, accompanied by the Ministry of Education. We had support from the first lady. This, this, this literally made me cry because the first lady came out strong and she said in the media that no matter what happens, no matter what they try to do, we are going to make sure that we prove to, the, to this government, to everybody, what comprehensive sexuality education is and what it's doing to the young girls in the schools today and out of school. So if we have to answer the question as to what have we done, this is what we have done. We have brought everybody together. We have collected all the efforts in regards to comprehensive sexuality education and we provided a presentation and we submitted that presentation to justify to justify why comprehensive sexuality education is, is of importance in the country. And one of the, the things that uh, I think happened, I would not say it's a great thing because this is, is data, it's people's lives, but it was evident enough to prove to the government that, uh, the, to prove the, to the government the absence and the presence, the difference between the absence and the presence of CSE in the schools or CSE in the, in the lives of adolescents and young women is, Last year, during this time, during this year, this time of the year, March, Namibia initiated a lockdown due to COVID-19 and the schools went on lockdown. A lot of learners were sent back home and they were in the care. Keep in mind, the learners went back home. They were in the care of their parents. They were in the care of these teachers. They were in the care of the traditional leaders. They're in the care of the faith-based leaders. But if you look at the number of teenage pregnancy, early and un 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 unintended pregnancy that has been reported in 2020, in 2020 in Namibia, it's shocking. We reported more than, and I'm talking about only the reported cases, more than 3,600 cases have been reported of early and unintended. We are talking about lives here. We are talking about more than 3,600. Young women are unable to go back to school today because they've fallen pregnant under the care of the community. That has proven what CSC has been doing in the last years and what happened in the absence of CSC when the schools went on lockdown. I think for now, I have so much to say. I'm very passionate about this, this topic. I don't want to be the only one talking here. I think I'll, let, I'll pack it here and I'll wait for questions that I can maybe that can allow me to elaborate more. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you so much, Clivert, for that very powerful input. Um, and I mean, you've just highlighted so many important issues, um, namely, I mean, the importance of, of community generated evidence um, to, to support CSE and show its importance, you know, for, for young people. And I mean, the example that you're making now showing the, what happens when we don't have CSE is, um, a very scary one, um, and we know that uh, we've seen similar 
um, dynamics um, in many parts of the world during this, this lockdown period. Um, so, I mean, I think that's such a crucial point. Thank you. Um, so my next question is for Dr. Machawira. And can I also ask, sorry, if our panelists, when you're responding, if, if you wouldn't mind um, turning your cameras on so that um, we can see you, please, um, if it's possible for you. Um, so my question for Dr. Machawira um, is what are institutions like UNESCO doing to promote CSE and ensure governments uphold uh, their commitment to CSE um, and to making CSE and, and sexual and reproductive health services available to young people? Um, and I'm just curious, and in, in, as you respond, if you, know, um, if you could also perhaps speak you know, around what maybe other UN agencies besides UNESCO um, can potentially do to, to support the implementation of, C of CSE in the region. Um, over to you, Patricia. Yes, um, so, so thank you very much, Haley, for your question. I'll start talking to, you know, what the UN family is, is doing, um, you know, at large in supporting comprehensive sexuality education. So you've heard very clearly from countries, you know, you, you've heard from Uganda, you've heard from Namibia around the ESA commitment. So I don't think I need to speak to that. I think for me, what came out from the countries is really showing that they own the ESA commitment from the government perspective and also from civil society perspective. So one thing that the UN has been doing is really supporting governments across Eastern and Southern Africa around the ESA ministerial commitment, which as you know, at that time in 2013, when it was endorsed by 20 countries in Eastern and Southern Africa, the countries agreed to nine key targets to improve adolescent and young people's sexual and reproductive health. Um, as this work has been underway, we've seen significant changes taking place at country level in specific adolescent and adolescent and youth health and education indicators um, across the region. The ESA commitment targets were set to be attained by the end of 2020. We currently are working on with the UN, we are currently working on an evaluation of the ESA commitment. Early findings uh, from that evaluation report are really clearly showing that the ESA commitment has put the spotlight on young people. It has promoted intersectoral collaboration. And more importantly, it has positioned the education sector as a critical player in advancing sexual and reproductive health and rights. Because this is primarily thought of as a health topic, we've seen through the ESA commitment the important role that education um, place. So the, the, the findings are still forthcoming, but you know, we've seen a number of positive trends. We've had our colleague from Namibia speak to some of those positive trends, uh, which we think can also be attributed to the ESA commitment, you know, trends including an overall decline in new HIV infections. We've seen slight increases in HIV knowledge levels. And like I said, we believe the ESA commitment has contributed to this because at country level, we've seen an, a massive scale up of comprehensive sexuality education programs and also access to sexual and reproductive health. But having said that, we know that challenges still remain in harmonizing laws to align national commitments, especially related to the age of consent to sex, marriage, and access to services and other family planning commodities. They still need to improve domestic, regional, and global resource mobilization. At the same time, we do have unfinished business, even though we've seen an overall decline in the number of new infections, we know that adolescent girls and young women are still disproportionately affected by HIV, with adolescent girls and young women making up 26% of new infections in the region. We also know that adolescent fertility rate in the ESA region is more than 2.3 times the global average. And in terms of age of sexual deb debut, we know that between 5 and 25% of our adolescent girls have had sexual intercourse by the age of 15. So what's clear is the ESA commitment has made a difference, but we still have unfinished business that needs to be attended to. We've had a number of country consultations as part of this um, evaluation. What is coming clearly from countries is that they are keen to continue and build on the successes and lessons learned from the ESA commitment with a continuation that will align the ESA commitment to the 2020 
2030 agenda. The conversation now is about what the new ESA commitment will look like, what are the new emerging issues that the region needs to be able to highlight and prioritize in this new commitment. But we are also seeing a number of new initiatives that are coming to support and bolster the work of the ESA commitment, including the Education Plus initiative, which is being led by UNAIDS, but championed by um, you know, five UN agencies. And the Education Plus really renewing focus on quality secondary education, universal access to comprehensive sexuality education, freedom from GBV and um, sexual violence. So I'm going to stop there in terms of what, you know, what the UN family has been doing to support um, this work. Great, thank you so much, Patricia. And it's very reassuring to hear that there, <clears throat> excuse me, is a high level of commitment amongst countries um, in spite of the very um, coordinated efforts of this counter movement um, to, to spread disinformation and to create panic, you know, as we also heard from Clivert in, in the Namibian context, and which we're really seeing across the region. Um, so it's, it's great to hear that, um, you know, there's positive news in terms of the renewal of the ESA commitment, um, and that countries are, are really reaffirming their commitment to to CSE and, uh, and SRHR, especially for young people. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, so my third question is for Amos and, and Clivert. Um, so we'll go to Amos first, and then we'll come, we'll come to Clivert. Um, but what I'm, what I'm curious to hear you speak about is what do you think it is that is, is driving the, the growing opposition against CSE um, in, in the region? Um, and, you know, we've heard a little bit from, from Clivert about the work that Afrien has done to, to counter uh, the efforts by the opposition to overturn um, government commitment to CSE. Um, so perhaps you can speak a little bit more about that, um, about that process, because also the story coming out of Namibia is that the young people saved CSE in Namibia. Um, so I'd really like it if you could speak more about that. Um, but yeah, so Amos, over to you first. Um, can you share, yeah, what in your opinion is driving the growing opposition um, and, and is there any kind of evidence or approaches that you're aware of that we could draw on to, to strengthen advocacy uh, for CSE and, and SRHR? Thank you so much. Uh, I'm unable to turn on the video. My network just became bad. I'm sure you're able to, I was hearing some quick sound, but um, should it improve, I'll be able to turn on the video and speak to everyone else. So good morning to, to our colleagues in the US and then the other parts. Good evening, colleagues from the Southern Africa and parts of Africa. So thanks a lot to all the speakers who have spoken. I think they have spoken very well in terms of uh, what has actually happened and uh, what's currently going on. So for me, when you ask me what is driving the growing opposition, I have a very simple answer. The answer is that first and foremost, we've become so comfortable in our space in such that um, we have stopped uh, cultivating new champions. We need to cultivate new champions that are going to speak to what is currently happening. I think the opposition hasn't been sleeping. For all of us, let me give you an example of uh, uh, what uh, uh, Patricia was just talking about in terms of the ESA commitment. We have been implementing the ESA commitment since I think eight years now, uh, since the, the signing, eight to 10 years. Now you can imagine that we have very few champions to speak to CSE. A number of governments have actually done a commendable job to ensure that um, CSE is integrated in the subject. So I will pick on an example of Zambia. So in Zambia, there is no subject called CSE. Our CSE is integrated in a number of subjects, okay? So it's integrated in different subjects and that's how it's taught. So what they have done, the curriculum developers, is that they have looked at similar topics and they have integrated CSE in those different topics. So you could remember well, when there was a call for suspension, 
people laugh to say, okay, what is it that you're going to suspend? Are we going to suspend the curriculum? Or are we going to suspend? There is no such issue as uh, a, sub, as a subject called CSE. It's integrated. That's number one. Number two, when you look at the way we have handled opposition, first and foremost, all of us need to use facts. When you look at what they are using, they are using materials that is not the truth of a particular country. That already is a failure on their side. They are using materials that were not even generated for CSE. I don't know where they got that materials from. So you need to look at what weapon the opposition is using for you to ensure that they are able to promote your agenda. Thirdly, I think the investment in CSC has also gone low. We need to ensure that we have an investment. The only investment that we have seen is that UNESCO is the one who is really pushing um, for CSE now. We need to see more investment from government. I think the UN family needs to push governments to invest more to ensure that CSE is not seen as a foreign agenda, but CSE is seen from what Clive was saying in terms of young people's demand, is seen as serving young people, is seen as protecting pregnancy, is seen as protecting and reducing HIV. That is the beginning point, and those are facts that we need to use. Thirdly, when you look at when the opposition was strong, the opposition became strong during the Republican time. I think it was Donald Trump, uh, Trump's time. And then fourthly, they are also targeting countries that are going into an election. They know that if a country has strong Christian beliefs, they will be able to use some of the elements that they are claiming to be in CSC to be their weapon of usage. So if we have to monitor the opposition, we need to know their trends. What trends are they using? Whom are they using? If you look at how um, Family Watch is actually uh, trends are, is that they are using Christian association okay so for us in zambia i'm glad and pleased to tell you that it's only one uh, cso which is claiming to have no facts to be talking about CSE. you know thirdly i think they have also invested hugely in these organizations for them to ensure that they actually try and prove their facts so they are working on emotions for parents they are working on emotions for political leaders they are working on emotions for the other religious leaders so for us to be strong, we need to cultivate new champions in all sectors. I'll give you another example. You know, when we began CS in Zambia, we had consulted a number of religious leaders and a number of also traditional leaders. Now with time, those traditional leaders will die, some will move away, and then the new ones will claim that they have not been consulted. Okay? Because they are new. How do you get consulted on something that happened eight years ago? You were not a in leadership. You are not a member of parliament. You were not a chief. So how do you get consulted? So what we need to do is that we need to create new champions. We need to create new leadership in ensuring that CSE is seen on equilibrium. Then we'll be able to have facts to ensure that that is done. Over. Thank you so much, Thank Amos. You so much, I really Amos. I really Thank you so much, Amos. Sorry, I have to hear there's an echo. Sorry, I have to hear there's an echo. Let me just stop. Okay, thank you so much, Amos. Um, I really like the point you made about how the opposition is working on the emotions of different stakeholders. Um, I think that is just such an apt description of the intention behind these disinformation campaigns and efforts to create moral panic. Um, so thank you so much. And um, I'd like to hand it over to Cliver to see if you would like to um, perhaps elaborate on, you know, um, some of the issues you had raised earlier around the youth-led advocacy to really save CSE in the country. Um, and yeah, perhaps some, some learning points or lessons that we could, we could take or draw from, from that experience. Um. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Haley. Um, I don't know now. I hope you can all see me. Sorry, I have a blue light in my house. <laughs> I don't like bright lights. They they they, they disturb my eyes. So um, I I don't know if I have to start first at <clears throat> what is driving the opposition, 
or do you want me to get right into what are the strategies that we have been using that I have already already touched on in regards to young people? Uh, but maybe uh, I don't know if you allow me. I can maybe add a little bit on what is driving the opposition. Then I can get to the strategies. Okay, perfect. Well, Thank first you. of all, um, I'm, I'm not gonna go talk. I'm not going to get into talking about the family watch. I think that is something that we all know already. We know what the family watch is all about. We know who they are. Uh, we know how they are engaging our po politicians, our traditional leaders. In, 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 in order to make sure that they, we do not advance the agenda of, of, of CSE. And, and like my brother from, from Zambia has, has, has alluded, uh, Namibia has also, after the, the turnaround now, we were asked to rename, which I still don't see the difference though, but we still ask, we're asked to rename because they, our, our politicians don't want to hear the term CSE. You know, saying, saying CSE is like walking into parliament and saying key population. When you say that, you're literally looking for serious trouble. So they don't want to hear CSE because they believe CSE comes with key population, LGBTQ, sexualizing and everything. So we were then asked to rename CSE, but still implementing the same curriculum under a different name, which is now called Life Skills Health and HIV-based education. Very interesting. Life skills, health, and HIV-based education. That's now. It's no more CS in Namibia. That's now. Life skills, health, and HIV-based education. Which is super interesting for me, though. Anyway, I believe, uh, like the first speaker that opened the, that had given the opening remark, she spoke very strong. She touched me when she said, that we have to understand that the teachers are the parents at home. The teachers are the traditional leaders. The teachers are also the faith-based leaders at home. So when we talk about teachers, you also need to understand which type of teacher are you capacitating? I think that's one thing, and we also brought it to the attention of the Ministry of Education. When we capacitate CS, uh, teachers on CSE, we have to understand who is this individual that we are capacitating? Because already, if you do not identify, if you do not ensure that you are capacitating the right person that is able to execute this curriculum or this program without judgment, without feeling that they are crossing their boundaries as or their faith-based boundaries or their traditional boundaries. Already, if you don't make sure of that, you're already, uh, increasing and adding and enabling the opposition growth. You already, because you, this is a person who's become a teacher, but she's, she or he does because of their traditional beliefs, because of their faith-based uh, beliefs, they believe that it, I cannot talk about this and then they do not execute. That's the first mistake we make already. The second thing I believe what's driving, I always say, when a person does not understand something, when a human being does not fully understand something, they are more likely to resist it. If you come in my community and you tell me you're going to set up a borehole and the borehole is going to suck water from the ground and that's what's gonna happen, and you do not break and pack this down, I'm gonna think you are either looking for a way to mine for some resources that I'm not, I was not aware they are there I'm looking for a, I'm gonna think you're looking for a way to exploit my community. So I think it is very important from the civil society uh, level to government level that we capacitate traditional leaders, parents, um, faith-based leaders, um, law enforcers. We must capacitate them with the complete and clear understanding on what CSE is about, number one, and what human rights are. In Namibia, we're engaging in a campaign now that I'm really, really strongly pushing and passionate about where we are saying we want to unpack, we want to domesticate human rights in every spoken language in Namibia. A lot of people, even myself, I only understand human rights in Portuguese and in English because I speak Portuguese at home and I speak English most of the time. But if you, I speak other languages that are Namibian languages, but 
I'm unable to have a conversation on human rights in those languages because it has never been domesticated. And I think that's the big issue we have at the moment because our communities believe human rights is right to education only, is right to have food only, is right to life only. But they don't believe that human rights is right for me to understand my body and to make informed decisions for me to be able to safeguard my life as a young person. This is what we need to bring to down to the community level. And, and moving into your question, what have you been doing? I want to um, refer to, to a dialogue that we had in one of the communities because we are having in, in, with African and uh, other young uh, uh, youth-led organization and civil society organization that are youth serving. What we do is we are trying to, or we have been doing um, community-led interventions, community-led outreaches, where we engage the community, where we bring traditional leaders, where we bring uh, local authorities, for example, governors. We have learned, uh, and I was very pleased one of the governors, a very young governor that is, is, is newly been appointed by the president here, and he's the driving is on the forefront of, of, of making sure that the implementation of uh, SRHR and CSE is in his own region. And governors are key people in Africa. I don't know about African countries, but in Namibia, governors, we call them gatekeepers of the region, of communities. They are gatekeepers because a traditional leader would rather listen to a governor than listen to a lawyer. A traditional leader would rather listen to a governor than listen to a police officer. A traditional leader would rather listen to a governor than listen to a principal or a teacher or somebody that is wearing a UN flag t-shirt or, or just a youth-led organization member. They rather listen to the governor because the governor is the one that governs the region where they are coming from. He is the one that is responsible for bringing the services apart from health services that services other elders need. He's the one of ensuring those services. He's the one that represents the government to them. So when you engage governors, you literally walk into the houses or into this community and you break down these barriers. And this is what we are doing. We are engaging governors, we are capacitating them. First of all, we need to make sure they are capacitated, they are well-trained and we engage these governors. And in one of the regions where we, we did this, we did a, a dialogue, we call it a parent-child dialogue, where it, it takes about four days. The first day we, 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 we talk to the parents, we capacitate the parents, we do presentation on CSE. The second day we, we, we do presentation of the school learners and, and the young people. The third day we bring them in the same room, facing opposite sides, where we literally say the parents are allowed to air out but how they feel about the topics and about these programs that they are, their children are learning at school. How does it make them feel at home? How, how what position are, do, do they feel they are put? Because a lot of parents say, I, I'm uncomfortable because my child comes at home and talking about condoms and I've never been capacitated about condoms. I don't know if it is right to talk about condoms. I don't know if it's okay to have this conversation with my child because I have never been trained. I don't know if this is, com it, 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 it's something that's seen normal in the community, or will I be seen as a, as a parent that is sexualizing her, his or her own children? And one of the, when it came to the learners, there was a girl who stood up and said, she wants to continue, and she wants her mom to allow her to continue getting capacitated and learning about CSE because she wants to be able to make the right decision for her to be able to finish school and protect herself from her uncle that visits her every night. Mind you, this girl, has, she's living in the house of her uncle with her mom and the, the uncle is the one that is the breadwinner is taking care of her and, and the mother. And the mother is aware of this, but the mother was unable to talk about it because she doesn't know if it's okay. And she, she, she's afraid if she talks about it, the uncle will kick them out of the house. But the girl got up and she said, I want my mom to understand that when I have a condom in my room is because I'm protecting myself because my uncle visits me at night and I want to know how to use a condom because I don't want to fall pregnant at, at the age that I am. I want to be able to finish my school and take care of my mother. So 
you can see the intention of this girl. And this is because of the information that she's getting at school to protect herself and, and make the informed decision for her to be able to finish her school. But the mother, because she was not capacitated and didn't think this, this is even something that she could report or she could address with her brother, nothing was being done. But because of this platform that was provided by the governor who engaged the community to be able to bring the parents out and the learners out to have a conversation, we were able to break free. And this is what I'm saying. Yes, of course, we need to engage media, especially for young people. We have a lot of young people that are in the media industry. We do engage media. I think media is one of the key things to put in the forefront of progressive social education. Wherever we are going, whatever we are doing, we make sure that we leave it open. We invite media to be able to convey the right message when it comes to the activities and the trainings that we are doing or the implementation of CSE. That is very important. And then we need to engage, obviously, the, the gatekeepers, which is the traditional leaders, and, and obviously the local authorities. I think when we engage these people, and these people are capacitated of this information, even politicians, when it has to come to election, they are able to be forced to touch on this for them to get votes, because we need to understand. Yeah, thank you very people much. You don't want to... I'll never finish, I told you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, what you were saying was just so powerful. It was really hard. Um, I didn't want to ask you to stop talking. And I think what you were saying was really um, important for everyone to hear. So thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to move on to our fourth and final question um, for Joris van Bommel and, and Patricia Machuira. Um, so I, I'm, I'm wanting to ask you, perhaps we can start with Joris, since we haven't heard you yet. Um, what, in your opinion, is the role of funders and donors in supporting governments to be able to effectively deliver on um, their commitments to, to CSE and, and SRHR? And just to highlight, I do have a question coming through from the chat um, that really touches on that question. Unfortunately, it's quite a long question and I can't, I can't really read the whole thing, but it's really about how do we go about strengthening um, the implementation of CSE? in specific countries yeah and how can donors um and funders assist in this thank you thank you very much Heidi. um yes i do think that donors and development farmers do play an important role but it's also a sensitive role in addressing uh, CSE um, uh, challenges and this role for me goes beyond just funding CSE activities uh, uh, for the netherlands provision of uh, SRHR and um, CSE information to young people is one of our key pillars, one of our key information pillars in our SRHR approach. Uh, and as uh, Rosetta already mentioned uh, in her introduction, Uganda has a very young population. I'm based in Uganda. Uh, and young girls are lacking information about sexuality and pregnant, pregnancy prevention. Uh, which together with, uh, with the unmet need for, for family planning methods contributes to a huge teenage pregnancy rate of more than 25%. Uh, uh, and as also mentioned by the previous speakers, the CSE is a proven strategy in decreasing unplanned pregnancies and STIs in that regard. Uh, young people do need and do want to have information. Um, they will get the information in one way or another way. That's also what, what Lita in her introduction remarks mentioned. Uh, better provide them with correct information uh, instead of uh, them as, as assessing all kinds of different uh, information. As a donor, as the Netherlands, for example, in Uganda, therefore, we try to support the implementation. It's also related to the question uh, raised in the chat. Uh, we're trying to really support the Ministry of Education on activities related to CSE and as the HR information and that we'll do that in, in different ways we do that through our uh, program with unfpa we'll do that with amref and with other strategic partnerships with as and ngos and CSOs such as online um, aids uh, it is that different layers the different ways of working uh, is important also for donors however i think it's important and i think also clive mentioned that a little bit that we have to be very very aware about the specific context in the countries we are supporting as a, as a, as a donor or development partner. Um, we need to be very conscious about the language we use, uh, the strength in the narrative, and also search for dialogue and common grounds. 
also on the concerns which are there. I think Clover gives some very interesting examples and teachers, but there are other, other people in opposition. Uh, we need to step away from, I think, quite often a kind of a responsive strategy we do have. Uh, we need to find a bit more in a defense way. I think we have to go much more to a, towards a deliberate strategy to deal with opposition or with people with different views or their concerns. Uh, I think you can see that as well in Uganda. Uh, despite the impressive consultation process on the CSZ framework, the framework faced and is still facing a lot of opposition. At the same time, I think we have to, to dive into that a little bit better. What is opposition? Uh, an opposition is not one homo homogeneous group. Uh, uh, an opposition is not against everything. This requires much more stronger analysis and targeted approaches. What are the concerns, etc.? We need to work much more with allies and find ways of, uh, of, 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 of moving forward. Um, but also finding ways of, of supporting and getting public support in that regard. I think, and that's my last remark for, 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 for now, I think if you look at Uganda, there is a strong commitment from the government of Uganda, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health, uh, the Ministry of Gender, for CSE, and to address the sexual health uh, needs of, uh, of adolescents, as well as my colleague from the Ministry of Education mentioned uh, in her opening uh, remarks. Uh, However, sometimes you see also a kind of discrepancy, this discrepancy between what the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health, the people in the ministries do want to do, do want to work, how do you operate at national level, and sometimes what is the narrative or the communication of the government at the national levels of platforms. For example, signing the Geneva Declaration, uh, sometimes much more conservative voices. That's what I meant with, we have to be very clear, what is that opposition? where can we work for? So it's important. I think we have shown some success in Uganda on, on having a, a respectful dialogue on the common concerns and on the CSE strategies. Uh, that can lead to interesting ways of working. And our programs in Uganda, uh, for example, with UNFPA, we do work closely with the Ministry of Education, but we also do work closely with the Interreligious Council of Uganda, which strengthens, which can strengthen the cultural and community, uh, community leaders together to work together, to discuss together as, as, a, as a child, but also DBV issues. Uh, uh, we do also work, for example, uh, with providers, but also directly with Ugandan Population Council uh, to assure that the message from the government that we take into account the sensitivities which are there at the different levels, whether it's a political one or another one. Uh, and at the same time, we try to work as a development partner, as a donor, with our strategic partnerships, uh, with grassroots organizations, etc., to really support at, 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 at the level of schools, at the level of health centers, uh, to implement what is already possible in the current CSE framework in Uganda. Thanks, back to you. Thanks so much, yours. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to now pass it over to Dr. Machawira. Um, and I'm curious if, um, you know, now we've heard from Yora some of the complexities around funding. Um, you know, of course, we know this is not always, you know, this it's very sensitive, the issue of, of um, funding, especially when it's, you know, international donor funding. Um, but I'm curious if you can also elaborate more on um, some of the activities, um, for example, different kinds of programming as yours has, has already begun to touch on, um, different kinds of activities that the UN agencies um, can, can support um, in order to, to build more support uh, for CSE and its implementation amongst you know, different stakeholder groups, politicians, educators, community leaders, for example. Thanks, over to you. Yes, um, thank you very much, Haley. I, I think just going back to the question of, of funding and you know what role can funders and donors do uh, play in supporting government? I think that if we look at the case, for example, of the ESA commitment, I think once a government makes a commitment, such as the ESA commitment, where they say we are going to commit to scale up CSE and services, I think the expectation from our end as the UN and partners is that this would be accompanied by an increase in domestic funding to make that commitment a reality. I think our advocacy efforts as the UN and other partners should ensure that 
even as we talk about the broader education sector plans, they should have a strong health component. So the school health component should be part of the broader education sector plan. The, the, the health work within education should not be work that is left for partners to support. So if we start from the education sector plans, we should make a provision in terms of the work plan and even allocate a budget from government perspective to the school health program, which is the program that would normally house the work on CSE that we are talking about. So if the if government is able, if we're able to support government to do that, they can then indicate the gaps which the partners can come in and support. But they would also have shown that as government, this is important to us. This is part and parcel of our daily work because if they do that, they, alloc they make sure that they allocate staff, they allocate resources to it. And then they can bring partners to the table to say, we have X amount in terms of domestic funding. And this is what we would want. I think as we move forward, we should also try to move away from empty commitments where government commits without putting money behind their commitment because you need to put money behind it to make it a reality. I think if there's one thing that COVID-19 has taught us is that it really given us a strong reminder that schools are more than just places of learning and that they provide critical contributions towards children's health and well-being. And the health agenda within education should really not be a side agenda that is part, you know, supported by partners, but it should be an agenda that the ministry runs with. Because at the end of the day, if we don't look after the health of the learners, we won't be able to attain the educational outcomes. We've seen how how, you know, pass rates have really decreased in a number of countries because learners were not able to go to school because of COVID. So really, I think what it has taught us is really put a spotlight on the importance of addressing health issues, health and well-being of learners, including through the provision of adolescent sexual and reproductive health information and services. So I think that if we reflect on, you know, the past couple of years, I think, and also looking, I want to now loop into the discussion of the opposition. I think as long as we don't support governments to be in the driving seat, we are going to continue to have challenges where the opposition says these programs are donor driven. They are actually not donor driven. I remember when we started talking about comprehensive security sexuality education in Zambia in, you know, in um, early 2000s and, and so on, the, the conversation was really driven and the entry points, you know, it was taken home quite quickly because of numbers of high um, teenage pregnancies in Zambia, high HIV infections. So really, you know, we were talking about, okay, let's move away from these life skills programs, which are very HIV focused to address some of these issues. So the programs, I think, you know, were driven by the realities on the ground. And what we found is that if governments own these programs, if governments are in the driving seat in responding to the opposition, we play a supportive role to government. We've had the role that civil society has played in Zambia. We've had the role that civil society, including young people themselves have played. But if government also plays a key role like they did in South Africa to dispel and you know come head to head with the opposition and say, look, what you're quoting to be the content of the curriculum is not accurate. This is our curriculum. We cannot afford to go back on our word. South Africa has the highest rate of number of new infections amongst adolescent girls and young women. South Africa has the highest rate of early and unintended pregnancy. So we cannot afford to pull this curriculum, you know, from 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 the school curriculum, we cannot afford to pull life orientation from the curriculum because we think this is a matter of national interest. We think this is important for the country. So as we do our work, I think it's really important to engage with government and also just go beyond education and health, who are the key partners that the sectors that we are working with. We've seen ministries of gender play a role in Uganda. We've seen, you know, role, and I'll say negative or positive. We've seen, you know, um, in the, the opposition going through the Ministry of Traditional Affairs and chiefs in, in, in Zambia. So I think we also need to broaden the conversation to go beyond education and health, to bring in other key sectors that have a stake in this work around young people, but really ensure that governments are in the driving seat and not only with their mouths, but also to bring their wallets to the table so that they can make their commitments a reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Machuera. Um, thank you. And I just want to say thank you so much to our esteemed panel. I think we've had a really robust and, and lively session and so many of the, the key challenges and around um, implementing CSE in the face of, 
of this opposition movement have come up as well as you know just amazing strategies um, that we've heard about and um, yeah, and, and the, the work that needs to be done going forward and, and the different the roles of different stakeholders in that. So thank you so much for such a enriching discussion. I'm sorry that we have to um, wrap it up so soon, um, but I think at this stage, um, I should hand it over to Lois um, for our closing remarks. I see Clivert's got his hand up. Um, but Clivert, perhaps you can post your comment in the chat, because um, I would like to hand it over to Lois to hear her closing remarks. So thank you so much, everyone, again, um, and I hope to see you all again. Bye. Thank you very much, uh, Henny McEwen, for really, really handling this uh, panel discussion very well. And I would also like to thank our panelists. This was a rich discussion from people that are really hands-on uh, on the issues, people who can speak to the issues as so eloquently. And tonight I had so many, you know, so many messages that we can really take forward and try to see how, what we can um, get out of those messages and what we can build going forward. Because as one of the speakers said, we, have relaxed, you know, we, uh, we are now taking it too easy because at some point we really thought uh, our goals were aligned, you know, we had it together. We really thought we were making progress in particularly in, in the countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, after we had the CSC commitment by, led by UNESCO, we, we really moved uh, such a distance that we never really expected to. But in the last few years, we have seen all those uh, uh, gains being broken down one by one as the opposition starts to gain ground. So we need to go back to the drawing board and really try to understand what we are dealing with here and what strategies we now need to craft that can ensure sustainability of any interventions that we put in place. I think Dr. Machawira put it very well. She kept stressing the need for us to put the governments at the center, the need for us to put responsibility in the hands of government so that they see this as an important intervention that they need in schools. But I think also there is a speaker who spoke very eloquently around the issue of evidence, because when you don't have evidence, then you can't win any fight that you are trying to push forward. And he spoke strongly about us collecting our evidence and then letting the young people speak for themselves, let them fight for, for CSE. And I was very excited to hear that because the moment you give the person who is affected to fight and speak for themselves, then the chances that uh, the young, the, the, the governments and the older people we listen become much, much higher. And then the role of all of us becomes that of catalyzing. We catalyze processes and we provide the resources, we provide the skills that are needed to keep the, 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 the you know, to keep us going and to make sure that we achieve our goals. Uh, so at this point, I think it would be in order if I invite our last speaker to give us the official closing remarks. Um, and our speaker is the Honorable Henny de Vries, who is uh, the ambassador, the Dutch ambassador in Maputo, Mozambique. She joined the Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2002 and was posted in Tanzania, Bangladesh, the Palestinian territories, in the Netherlands, working mainly on governance, gender, and economic development. Before joining the Minister of Foreign Affairs, she worked at the Dutch Minister of Social Affairs as a social economic researcher and a gender coordinator for the central government. So please, Honorable, I uh, would like to provide you with this platform to give us uh, some closing remarks. 
Thank you very much, uh, Lois. It's really a great honor for me to be here today. Uh, it's really, it was great to hear all the experiences, all the insights shared. I learned a lot, I have to say, and it was a very rich and good discussion, in my opinion. Really, really, uh, yeah, I'm honored, like I said, to be here. I would like to tell a little bit, I would like to add to the experiences of Zambia, Uganda, South Africa, and Namibia by also saying something about Mozambique. My embassy also has a program uh, on uh, SRHR, and uh, we also work on comprehensive uh, sexuality education because we feel it's very important, like also Euros already stressed, that young people are well informed and can make healthy choices. So there's an urgent need, we feel, to give correct information about the, the body, intimacy, sex, sexuality, getting pregnant, STIs, and of course, the current situation in the country, the pandemic, uh, the COVID situation in Mozambique has been a real setback because schools have, of course, been closed. We see early pregnancies uh, increasing, we see gender-based uh, gender violence increasing, and uh, the schools have recently opened again, but many school uh, girls are not returning to school. So that's, of course, a very high risk also. Uh, unfortunately, like in some other countries, we also see some backlashes here in Mozambique. We see that there is some the, the government is really going a little bit backwards in, 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 in its promise to provide CSE in all schools. And we don't know exactly where it's coming from, but we are having a discussion among the, with the Ministry of Health, for example, Education, the Ministry of Gender also, UN agencies, civil society organizations, teachers and parents to identify where is this exactly coming from and why do we suddenly see this hesitation in government. But having said that, all the discussions we have, and that was already stressed also in the debate we had, there's also an urgency, we have to move forward. I recently met with Grasa Michelle and Grasa Michelle was saying, look, we have been put back 10 years, according to her. We have been, this is, has been a, a very difficult period for the rights of women and girls, for SRHR, for, for protecting young people. And we have now to accelerate. And I think also to, tonight we heard that this urgency is really there. So we have to move forward in my opinion. And we know that CSE is very, very crucial. It has to be made widely available in schools. It has to be championed by political leaders. That's why in Mozambique, we started a group of female ambassadors and we're talking with ministers, different ministers to bring this message across. How can we help? How can we, we, what are your hesitations? What can we do to support? Because we really feel that CSE is very crucial to stop new HIV infections, to, to, to protect uh, uh, adolescents, to, to end gender-based violence, to prevent unwanted pregnancies, to keep girls in school. So that's why we feel this is a very important tool and a tool we have to promote by all means. So unfortunately, there are a lot of bar barriers still there and we heard speak about those barriers, but we have to see how we can build bridges between different partners, between different players, uh, how we can convince the government to, to run with CSE, to run with SRHR, and that's why we need to explore different strategies. We cannot sit back, we have to move, like I already said. So that means searching indeed, I do agree with yours and others, we have to search for common grounds, we have to bring people together, we have to see where we have shared values. Yeah, to put it in a Dutch perspective, we have to see where we can build bridges. So, um, and that also means we have to look for the right language, we have to see how, what people can accept, where the real bottlenecks are, what is exactly the sensitive topic. So analyze, see where we can join hands, see how we can move things forward. I also strongly believe, very strongly believe that we have to speak with young people. And we have to, so I was very pleased with the intervention of Lita. I really feel that they should be at the center of our discussions and that we have to learn from them also, where is the problem 
how can we support what do you exactly need and and how can we help you in having making sure that you can make the choices that we that the services are available in the country that you do have the right information so how can we help you so i feel very much that young people should be at the center of our response so wrapping up i think we have to keep our antenna high we have to ha keep our ears and eyes wide open we have to be alert and we have to make sure that we can counter any opposition we are confronted with. We have to share information. We have to share lessons learned. We have to work with like-minded partners. We have also to look beyond the usual suspects to work with. We have to explore who else can we work with. Religious leaders was already mentioned a lot. Community leaders, of course. So I think we have to search for a coordinated action because no single agency can do this alone. We have to join hands, civil society, the UN, governments, ministries, parliaments, teachers unions, young people, traditional leaders, donors. It should be a joint agenda which we carry forward. It should be strategic, it should be multi-level, and we need simultaneous advocacy engagements. And let's not underestimate that there is an opposition and that we have, therefore, we have to run faster, we have to do better. Let's, let's really support the young people, especially girls, and let's make sure that everybody has the option to lead a healthy life. Let's give them those tools. Thank you very much for your attention. And once again, I was extremely honored to be part and parcel of it. Thank you. Lois, you're on mute there. I was about to congratulate myself because uh, tonight I had not been told that I'm on mute, but looks it looks like it was not going to be. But uh, let me just say thank you so much to the Honorable Ambassador for those uh, really powerful closing remarks. And in those remarks, you have been you have clearly articulated what we need to do going forward. And um, in, in the last one second, I will just add two strategic opportunities that we should all watch for and try to contribute towards. One is the new UNAID strategy and the upcoming uh, high level meeting on AIDS at which we know that there will be a content session of for the language and we need to ensure that we protect the language of CSE to stay in those key documents. The other one is the CSE commitments under the Generation Equality Forum and working to ensure that governments are making the linkages between HIV, health and education. And uh, there are key platforms. We know that the, the, there is going to be a huge uh, conference or summit in Mexico on the generation equality in the coming few weeks. So let's stay alert and uh, look at how we can use some of those uh, platforms to continue to push the language of CSE. I will not uh, dilute the ambassador's message. I think she was so clear. The one thing I just want to repeat, which is what she said and everyone said tonight, is that young people must be at the center. and they must ask us how we must ask how can we help you and so with those words let me again thank you everyone thank everyone who participated also thank the staff that worked behind the scenes for all these things to happen there are people whose faces are never seen but without them nothing would happen let me also really say thank you to you um, and with those few words uh, good night until next time, thank you.